I'm Joe Devine and welcome to Whiteboard Football Extra. A quick note before we get started with today's podcast. The series is now available to listen to on iTunes and SoundCloud as well as YouTube. If you're listening on YouTube, a link to our iTunes page will be provided in the description. After 25 years, 617 appearances and 250 goals for Roma, Francesco Totti is finally retiring. Last week, we made a video looking at the various tactical uses of the player on the Umaxit Football YouTube channel, and today I'm joined by Alex Stewart to continue the discussion. At the beginning of the video, uh, you note that with 250 goals, Totti is second only to Silvio Piola in Serie A's all-time goals list. Now, a couple of comments on the video suggested, perhaps unfairly, um, that Totti isn't this wonderful player that, that people make him out to be, but his USP, if you like, is is enhanced by the fact that he never left Roma or that he's you know very loyal. Um, could his position in the goal scoring list be as a result of the fact that he stayed at the same club in the same league for such a long time, or, or you know can his statistics show us that that he really was a top player? I think he really was a top player. I um, I find this a slightly fatuous argument that in some way staying with one team uh, negates or diminishes the achievement. Nobody is saying that Ryan Giggs wasn't one of the greatest players that the Premier League era has ever seen, simply because he stayed at Manchester United. He scored. Well, um, to, just to interject for a minute, I think, I mean, certainly what I meant by it was that, based on the fact that Totti played in Serie A for, what, I mean, over 20 years, and just, I suppose, again, based on the fact that he was, you know, maybe to a lesser extent, he played with the same same club, obviously, as we've seen in the video, the systems and the personnel changed. But, you know, he he would have remained settled for for a lot of that time. What I mean is, do you, do you ever see those sort of anomalies in, in, in those lists like top goal scorers where a player who is a good player, but is, you know, in a in the same league for 20 years can be higher up the list based on the fact that, you know, based on that fact that they've been there for a lot longer than other players? Oh, I think, I think longevity certainly plays a part. Um, and Serie A... I think maybe has more of a track record of keeping players fit and healthy for longer. There's an argument to say that it's a slightly slower, less physical league. And so it it does allow players to have a, a longevity in their career that maybe if, if Sotti had played in the much more physical, much more energetic Premier League, he, he wouldn't have managed that. Um, but I don't think it diminishes his achievements. You know, at, for a start, as you say, he played under a wide variety of different managers in different systems in different positions, and he's also played against uh, top class players in a league where uh, tactical astuteness and uh, defensive systems are probably more highly prized than anywhere else so he's got a magnificent scoring record uh, it's a magnificent scoring record in in absolute terms as well as simply in terms of of his uh, of serie a. And that's been achieved in a league where defence is so important, where some of the greatest goalkeepers, greatest defenders of the last 20 years have emerged. So I, I don't think it diminishes his standing globally. Um, yeah, he's a World Cup winner as well. It's you know, it's, it's not like he's he's only been OK because he sort of potted around in Serie A for 20 years and notched up a few goals along the way. The video shows Totti's adaptability in that he's, you know, as we say, he's been played in a number of positions throughout his career under lots of different managers as well. Um, do you think that he would translate to the Premier League? I know we just touched on it there in terms of longevity, but do you, do you think he would would have been a successful uh, transfer or is he what somebody might call, you know, a luxury player? Uh, one commenter did compare him to to Ozil at one point so I wondered what you thought on that and obviously this is within the realms of totally hypothetical and very difficult to answer so have a go at that Alex. <laughs> yeah um, a luxury player is the sort of pejorative term that that annoys me and my apologies to whichever commenter has has put it um, I mean if you want to compare him to Ozil as a luxury player Ozil's created the most chances for Arsenal so far this season so I don't know quite how you define luxury look I think what Totti showed throughout his career was that he could adapt either to playing as an out-and-out striker, as a left winger or a left attacking playmaker, uh, or playing in the hole. And particularly in that Luciano Spalletti 
uh, system, the sort of strikerless system that, that is highlighted in the video. That required a huge amount of work rate. You know, that's not just somebody who's who's good at shooting, good at scoring, good at creating for other people. The the amount of movement required to create the space for other players to move into, the positional awareness that was required to to drop into space, to know how to link up with other players. That's not somebody who sort of potters around the the penalty area and waits for the opportunity to score. Um, I think in the English game, there, there can be a sense that players like Totti, players who are, are either kind of tens or nine and a halves, are luxury in the sense that maybe their work rate isn't so high. Um, and that <laughs> to, to kind of use that cliche, you know, could they cut it on a, a cold rainy night in Stoke on a Wednesday or whatever it is? Um, I think that's nonsense. I think good players are good players. You only have to look at the fact that Zlatan Ibrahimovic, for example, was consistently criticised as a luxury player, as a flat track bully. He's come over uh, at the age of 35. He's Manchester United's top scorer. He's contributed either through scoring or assisting 42% of all of Manchester United's goals this season. You know, that that's not a luxury player. That's somebody who is integral to the way that team is playing. And I think Francesco Totti, had he come to the Premier League at the right sort of age, I would suggest maybe, you know, 25, 26, something like that, he would have been an absolutely stellar player here. Whether he would have lasted quite so long, I don't know. I think that's a separate issue. Um, But he wouldn't have been a luxury. He would have been outstanding. On the sort of tangent here, we we mentioned... Urzel there, and I'm aware that this isn't a podcast about Meza Urzel or Arsenal. But since we, I don't think we we have in the plans at the minute any um, any look at Arsenal's current team in a tactical video. I wonder, I wonder what you think of him. And I think, you know, going back to that that pejorative term as you call it, luxury player. I think you're right in that people sometimes infer that that means uh, a lack of work rate, a work rate, or perhaps that they you know don't defensively contribute in the way that other players in that position might. So. That sort of player, and I'm not suggesting that this is this this is Ozil, but you know, a luxury player might be someone who, you know, almost leaves the, leaves the defensive team with 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 ten players rather than eleven, but still contributes, you know, a lot going forward in terms of chances created and stuff. So, on that note, as a brief aside, what do you think of Ozil? Um, I think it's a really interesting question, not not necessarily about Ozil specifically, but opening up as as a kind of wider debate. If we if we draw it back to Totti, actually, partly to answer that question, in the Fabio Capello setup, um, there was very much an emphasis on having a really workmanlike central pairing in midfield, precisely to afford Totti the room to play as an out and out creative, uh, somebody who didn't have to track back, who didn't have to defend in the same way. So I think a luxury player, whether it's Özil or, or anybody else who might fall into that and it it is playmakers we're talking about particularly ones who play in the hole behind a striker Um, they are luxury in so far as they require other players to do their work for them defensively generally speaking I mean I think you can look at people like Christian Eriksen and say that's you know that's part of what makes Eriksen or or Gilfie Sigurdsson as well so good is that they actually contribute more widely but it's up to a manager to build a team that balances defence and attack. And if a manager decides that a player like Ozil, for example, is is so important, then you create a more solid midfield that compensates for that. Um, If you want to call that a luxury, then that implies that every single player needs to contribute defensively. But a good manager, and we've seen this time and time again, particularly in Italy, a good manager is able to build a starting eleven that mitigates for the fact that that maybe one player doesn't do as much defensively. You know, you, you bulk out the midfield or you play with three at the back and wing backs, however it's achieved, um, in order that you have a creative player who can unlock defences, who can set up strikers and who can, can, you know, not conceding goals wins games, but you have to score goals as well. Um, and maybe the issue with Ozil, particularly in this current season, is that the midfielders that he's had playing behind him have not been quite so capable of compensating for what he doesn't bring defensively and that that's the issue. Um, And also perhaps the the kind of the English mentality is everybody needs to run themselves into ground. 
into the ground. Everybody needs to contribute defensively and snap into tackles. And that in other leagues, they would look at that attitude and think, you know, that that's silly. We need to allow creators the opportunity to create. It's interesting that, that you talk about managers in Italy, you know, sh- shifting playmakers. We've talked about that in previous videos, the different positions of playmakers. And I'm, I'm thinking now of Andrea Perlo in that Juventus team when they realised that there was too much uh, defending going on when he was played in the number 10 position. So they, they pulled him back to that regista position. Um, and of course, that's what happened in the, the 2006 Italy team as well that Totti featured in, where I suppose the manager created a system that allowed both Perlo and Totti ahead and behind in the midfield to to be creators and I suppose to, to play at their maximum potential. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. And and it obviously it's instructive that in that team, Gennaro Gattuso was the guy who did all of the running. Um, and also that you had players out wide, particularly Karim Marinesi, who were very capable of tucking in and assisting in the midfield, almost to create a kind of 4-1-3-1 um, a, a system whereby um, the, the the compactness in the central midfield is bulked out, not by having players centrally, but by having the wide players tucking in. Um it, I don't know. I don't want to say that Italian football prizes playmaking more highly than English football, but I think that that, that is perhaps true, that, that there's a, a recognition that actually if you allow players of the quality of Andrea Pirlo or uh, Totti to, to have the space that they need and protect them with more workmanlike midfielders around them, that is the best way to, to set up a team. And it's interesting that that some of the more elegant and interesting playmakers in in the Premier League either come from abroad uh, or are sort of young English players who maybe haven't yet got the chance to kind of push forwards uh, and and make a first team slot their own. And that the best English midfielders, Paul Scholes, I would say, is that, um, well, actually even Paul Scholes, I mean, Paul Scholes was a playmaker, but he was kind of a box to box playmaker. Um, there was a, a, a dynamism to his game. He wasn't sort of sitting off quite in the way that Pirlo did. And then you have people like Gerard, you have people like Lampard, and there's a much greater dynamism to those players. It wasn't that they, I think, weren't capable of playing in that sort of Pirlo style, um, particularly, I think, um, Lampard at his peak could do pretty much anything he wanted. But the way they were utilised by the managers that had them at the time required a greater dynamism, a greater energy, the desire to get up into the box and score goals. And and that much more kind of laconic style of of sitting back and dictating things, Uh, something that I think David Beckham maybe tried to, to angle towards in his the, the latter days of his career is just something that doesn't seem to happen in English football quite so much. It seemed quite fortuitous that Totti would be managed by Zdenek Zeman at such a young age. Um, as you point out in the video, uh, that Zeman shifted Totti you know, to, to that left forward role, which obviously had a great impact. Zeman seems like quite an interesting character, and I thought this could be an opportunity for you to tell us a little bit more about him, Alex. Yeah, Zeman is a really interesting character. He's currently in charge of um, Pascara, who are rooted to the bottom of Serie A. Um, although he was brought in, uh, I think, sort of January, February time, uh, so halfway through the season. He'd, I mean, they were pretty much already guaranteed to be relegated by then. Um, he started as a coach in the 60s um, and began with amateur level football in uh, in Sicily and then had an opportunity to work at Palermo as a youth coach um, and basically that then began an extraordinarily peripatetic career, almost exclusively in Italy. He has had, he had a spell in Fenerbahce, he had a spell at Red Star Belgrade, but pretty much everywhere else he's been has been in Italy. He is known as an incredibly attacking coach. Um, you sometimes, I think, see uh, on, on Twitter or whatever the pictures of, um, of Zeman teams kicking off And they have maybe five or six players right on the halfway line who basically pump straight after the ball as soon as the opposition have kicked it back. Um, He plays in a 4-3-3 and that sees wing backs pushing very, very high up. So there's almost basically playing two at the back. Um, He presses very, very aggressively. Uh, He likes the ball to be whipped forward. He likes... 
his central defenders to be able to to carry it up and lay it off. It's a kind of very, very fluid, very attacking system, which scores a huge number of goals, but obviously can leave a team uh, slightly vulnerable at the back. He, he's had success. Um, you know, he's he's done very well, I think, overachieving, winning Serie B with Foggia, Serie B with Pescara, but Otherwise, you know, he's he's not really kind of hit the heights and, and won silverware. It's more that he's, um, you know, he's kind of seen as a coach that revitalizes teams, that, that gets an attacking swagger into the way they play, who scores an enormous number of goals and plays really exciting, imaginative football. He sounds great. Yeah, yeah, he sounds great. I mean, I, I don't know if, you, if you're a player kind of with Zeman coming in to manage you, he's, he's, he's known as being very, um, very hardcore when it comes to particularly physical training, because yeah. you, you need to be in peak physical condition to, to play the way he does. Um, ironically, he's actually a chain smoker, so he's not partaking in that himself. But I think you might think, oh God, you know, I'm going to have to be running through forests or up and down stairs or whatever when he comes in. But um, I think he, in terms of his development of Totti, I think he gave, certainly he developed Totti physically, you know, uh, where Totti was at the kind of age where, where he was just, just ready to kind of break through and, and Zeman, I think made him a lot tougher physically, uh, a lot fitter, but also allowed him to understand particularly how wide players can drop off into space. Um, Zeman's to the, the two wider players in, in the front three of a Zeman team tend to move around an enormous amount. They, they drop off, they pull wide, they tuck into space behind the centre forward. And I think that gave Totti the freedom to be imaginative. He, he saw that within a system, you could play in that kind of way. You could find space yourself. You could play in the channels in between the lines. Um, and I think that kind of freed him up imaginatively rather than just playing as a kind of out-and-out striker, which is what he very much started as. Well, on that note, let's talk a little bit about his adaptability. Um, what does that tell us about, about the league? You know, Is it fair to say that Syria is a more tactical league than the Premier League, or is that a fallacy? And again, difficult question to answer. Yeah, I mean, it's a very broad question. I, I'd say the, the straightforward answer is probably yes. Um, I think if you were to characterise the two leagues, you'd say that Serie A was, was more tactically astute and more defensive. Uh, the Premier League was more attacking and more about physicality and speed. That's not to say that there aren't play, you know, uh, managers in Serie A who think that being physically fit is very important and that there are no one who's managing the tactical in the Premier League is, is tactically aware, tactically astute. That That's obviously a nonsense, but... I think what you can see is that there's a, a high turnover of managers in Serie A and that across the time that Totti was at Roma, you know, we picked out three for the video because they were in some ways three of the most interesting ones. Um, but they're three very different systems. Um, there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of fluidity in the way that teams were lining up, in the way that one team lined up across the course of five or six years, the big, big shifts if you look at the Premier League this season, you know, you've still got teams playing a, a kind of a very straightforward 4-2-3-1. There's kind of a hoo-ha when teams shift to three at the back. Um, and it's, I don't know, it, it just, it feels to me like evolution tactically in the Premier League happens more slowly. Um, or that when it does happen, as in the course of a you know one result, like when Chelsea moved to a back three, everybody's kind of staggered that there's such a, an abrupt tactical shift. Um, I think in Serie A, if that happened, people would go, okay, yeah, you know, that's it hasn't been working. We need to change it. Um, I think if you read a lot about uh, about Serie A as well, um, I'm currently reading Carlo Ancelotti's book on management, which is it's interesting enough, but. You know, he talks very clearly about devising systems to fit players that he has, you know, and, and thinking, well, you know, if I've got a team with with Pirlo and, and Seydorf and Kaká and um, Rui Costa, then, you know, I, I need to work out how to fit all of them in because they're all incredible players. I don't know if that sort of 
again, I, I don't want to say the word luxury, but that kind of luxury system would necessarily be one that, that people in the Premier League would, would jump at. I think there's a sense that somehow you have to be more resilient, more solid um, in the Premier League, that that's what works rather than thinking, you know, I've, I've got all of these wonderful attacking players. I think that if you look at what Pep Guardiola is starting to achieve at Manchester City, you know, that that system that he's used, he, he named his first unchanged lineup uh, in consecutive games against Leicester. And you've basically got Yaya Toure as a kind of sitting midfielder. Well, you know, he's he's still a very good creative player. And then ahead of him, you've got Sterling, De Bruyne, Silva, Sane, and then a striker. You know, that's extraordinarily attacking. Um, and I, I don't think that you'd have many managers otherwise who would have the courage to have that sort of lineup. And it's working for them at the moment. You know, it'd be interesting to see how that that team develops I think they're probably you know two full backs and a and a defensive midfield upgrade on Yaya Toure away from being a great team but that's that same sort of sense with as what Ancelotti was doing with AC Milan it was I've got incredible attacking talent how do I devise a system that fits them all in rather than I've got incredible attacking talent so I'm going to rotate them which is what you know a lot of managers would do in the Premier League. Okay, let's head over to some user comments. Zesty says, I'd like to know more concerning the environment which led to him staying loyal to Roma in times where he was almost certainly quite fancied amongst other clubs. Um, I mean, obviously, I think the main thing to say here probably is that he was he was a Roma fan. Is that right, Alex? Yeah, um, he grew up in Rome. Uh, I think he'd always wanted to play for Roma. Um, and I think that there's absolutely uh, loyalty as a kind of main function. And he has said previously, you know, if it was about the money, then I would have gone somewhere else. It, it was about playing for Roma. Um, I, I, I had to look into this a little bit because I, I don't know so much about that kind of background stuff. And it certainly seems like, particularly in his sort of mid to late twenties, there was interest from, you know, sort of the usual suspects, people like Real Madrid, Barcelona, and um, whether it's a question of, of those bids, not actually, not actually materializing uh, or whether they did and he turned them down. I think that's all, that's all quite murky. Um, yeah, the simple fact is that the guy was playing for a club that he loved. He was the captain, uh, youngest ever Serie A captain. Um, and he was adored by the people he was playing for. So, and it's not like he probably wasn't being handsomely remunerated there as well <laughs> you know he wasn't he wasn't on the bread line and just doing it for the love um so I think also as well you know maybe there was an extent to which as his career progressed and certainly managers who've been at Roma have hinted at this that he he had not necessarily a, a, a kind of final say but but certainly a significant input into team selection and acquisitions and stuff like that again that's you know that's kind of conjectural and I'm I'm picking that out of what what people have reported but you know maybe if he felt like he had that kind of influence at Roma he would never achieve that same level of influence at another club so he wanted to stay there and I believe it's in his contract that he's a director of the club once he retires from playing so again that that sort of suggests that that he's almost been building up towards that level of involvement. Yeah, well, I was going to say perhaps we'll see him move into uh, move into coaching or into you know, backroom staff or something at the club. Wouldn't surprise me. Um, Ty Gummerman notes that we could have mentioned his lack of a weak foot. Fair point. Two lovely feet. Uh, Tim Lou ninety two says the fact that he's still playing in his forties showcases his incredible professionalism. Uh, we did mention longevity a little bit earlier, and obviously the difference, you know, the potential difference between the leagues. But I think you'll agree, Alex, that despite all that, playing in your 40s at the top level in Syria is, um, requires a lot of hard work. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even even the players at Milan had a particular track record of, of coaxing players into their late 30s with the Milan lab. And that that's still, you know, doesn't detract in any way from the the application, the fitness work that's required to do that. And, you know, whether they're goalkeepers or outfield players, it, it's remarkable 
Um, I also think actually from a mental perspective, uh, you know, having the determination to continue to train, continue to turn up when you're already a wealthy person and presumably, I, I wouldn't say, you know, physically exhausted, but your body will have taken certain knocks. There will have been injuries and so on and so forth. So having the, the desire, right, that's kind of a wishy-washy and tangible, but, but still wanting to, to put in the work that's required to stay at that level is remarkable. And I think, again, if we'd seen him move to another club, it's entirely possible that that, that would have, you know, um, sort of tailed off somewhat and he, he wouldn't still be turning out. But because it's Roma, because it's his hometown club, his boyhood club, you know, that, that level of effort is still there. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting. As, you know, the, the intangible that you mentioned there, desire, I think that's something that you see with... with you know, well, I suppose, you know, more generally all top top level football players, but amongst the elite, that's something when you look at Cristiano Ronaldo, for example, he, he almost seems desperate uh, to to be the best he can or be better. And that's that's definitely admirable, whatever you think of, of those players. Oh, you completely agree. And, and I think if you look at people like Ronaldo, uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, e- even people like John Terry, I mean, I'm no fan of John Terry's, but one thing that's always said is that they, you know, they train really, really hard. They work really, really hard. David Beckham was the same. Um, Frank Lampard was the same. Steven Gerrard was the same. And I don't think you can solely put that down to kind of the ego of still wanting to play. I think these people take what they do very, very seriously and are utterly committed to winning and utterly committed to being the best they can be. And that that level of commitment is required to well, to sustain yourself at any decent level in sport. You have to be like that. But to hit the heights that they do, I think, requires something really special. Gavin Smith asks, out of the three tactics shown, which by which I think he means the three different managers that we talked about in the video, which was your favourite, Alex, and uh, which influenced soccer in Syria the most? I I think that's an interesting question. Um, my, he has said specifically in Syria because I, I mean my first thought when I read this question was um, I don't know a great deal about about the history of it. We hinted that uh, the Spalletti system, the, the strikerless one, might have influenced some other teams in Europe. So I, I don't know if we can expand the question to be football generally rather than football in Syria, or maybe you can have a pop at both. <laughs> um, maybe I think I think in terms of my favourite, I I probably would would pick the Spalletti one. Um, that's partly because I didn't watch uh, Zeman's Roma play regularly, whereas um, the Spalletti one, I think you know, sort of more generally aware of when it was happening, and and actually watched a number of games at the time. Um, and it was really exciting to watch that. Um, I think both of those tactics, the Zemans and Spalletti's, were also engaging because they didn't always work. You know, it wasn't that the, the Capello tactic had a kind of greater degree of efficiency, a sort of Mourinho-like solidity in grinding it out, which doesn't always make for the most exciting football. Whereas teams that sort of throw everything at a style of attacking and and yet still get turned over those are you know almost more romantic and more enjoyable because of it i think in terms of influencing soccer soccer football more generally uh it would certainly be the spalletti one uh, i don't think there's any doubt about that um and again i'd refer you to the the final chapter in wilson's inverting the pyramid which talks about how this sort of 460 formation um is the one that that kind of, in some respects, hints at the future of, of football, where you've got a kind of a solid defensive unit, and then ahead of that, whether it's five or six, you know, with a with a sitting midfielder or not, um, that that degree of rotation of flexibility is what creates attacking movement that is harder to defend against as teams become. Uh, better drilled defensively and particularly as the press is engaged the ability to find space more particularly by pulling your opponents out of their position rather than you moving yourself uh, and finding it is is going to be the way that it's easier to unlock defenses and I think actually to, to refer back to what we were saying before Pep Guardiola 
you know, if he's using someone like uh, Gabriel Jesus uh, as a a forward ahead of a, a line of you know four midfielders, all of whom really are either central attacking or wide attacking midfielders, that that kind of has a four one five feel to it. Um, and there are hints of what Spalletti did in that, I think. Um, in terms of influencing Serie A, oh, I think that's a really hard question. Um, I, I just, you know, I, I think it's one of those things where you look at the level of, of flexibility in Serie A. I don't, I don't think it's as easy to identify tactical trends in Serie A like that um, as it is perhaps in say you know looking at the tactics that you see exemplified by various teams in the Champions League um, which is where I would say Spalletti's tactics were most influential um, mm. well I'll let you off on that one because we're short on time anyway okay but I did want to say that's the, very kind uh, of you that's yeah you're welcome I did want to say of the uh, of what you were just talking about that with the Spalletti formation there I, I really like that idea that you know it almost came out of an accident you know Spalletti uh, needed to sort something out because there were lots of injuries within the team and I like the idea that you know the result of that kind of it, it reminds me of you know mutations within the human body or something a kind of a kind of accident uh, occurs and creates something better I, I think that's I think that's a very interesting idea finally before we finish Alex um uh Rob Moss says I think I speak for everyone when I ask when are you going to do Steve Sidwell um and I feel like we're p- p- probably not but that we, you know, for Rob Moss and for the everyone that he's asking for, we might be able to give him a little taste of Steve Sibwell uh, just at the end of this podcast. I mean, Steve Sibwell, let's, okay, 200 games played in the Premier League, obviously for five clubs, Fulham, Reading, Villa, Chelsea and Stoke. Sibwell managed to score 21 goals in that period, um, which is actually not too bad when you consider it. 14 of those goals in 92 appearances for Fulham which he scored uh, at a rate of one goal every 525 minutes. Um, Not quite Francesco Totti levels, but still not too bad. Uh, 14 assists in that period as well. Uh, Never got an assist for Stoke, never got a goal for Stoke either. So he probably doesn't look back too fondly on that period. Um, I think he was a sort of competent, tidy midfielder who got into the box occasionally. And, you know, I don't think he ever set the world on fire, but... It's the Steve Sidwells of this world that keep the Premier League ticking over, isn't it? So. Well, I was going to say, he must have done something because he was a Premier League footballer for a long time. So maybe it was just his uh, work ethic and, uh, I suppose, his functional approach. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, 200 appearances in the Premier League is is absolutely not to be sniffed at. Um, and I think he commanded reasonably high transfer fee at least once that may have been the move to to Chelsea but but yeah that's about it I'm not sure it's it's enough to merit a video on um, but it's well, a commendable career to be sniffed at I, I one wonders whether Rob Moss was being serious or not in which case 200 Premier League appearances don't sniff at that and if you were joking as I suspect you are then yes he wasn't that good um alex thanks very much and we will speak to you again uh, in a few weeks on thank you joe